whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. You crown the year with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing.
please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, blessed be your name. You are our strength. You are our peace. You are everything. Thank you for this opportunity to come together to sing your praises. And we ask, Lord, flood our hearts with your love and with your grace. As we approach this time of offering, Lord, we pray that we see this as a continuation of worship. And we acknowledge that our tithes and offerings are not a way of obtaining your love, but a simple response to what Jesus did because of your love. Amen. in our service for prayer and we're going to start off just by spending a few seconds moments in silent prayer lifting up our own concerns our needs our our praises to the lord we'll gather back i'll pray over us and then we'll end in the lord's prayer let's pray
Almighty God, we are so grateful to be here in your presence, to be able to worship you in freedom and in openness, to not fear persecution for being here in your presence. Lord, we are so grateful that you are our God, that you have extended yourself to us, and not by some elite status, but because you don't want any of us to be without you. And Lord, we are so grateful to have a Father who loves us so much, that not only would you come and die for us, but that you would seek us out. I was reminded today of the parable of the lost sheep, that even when you have 99, you'll risk your life for one. Lord, we thank you for that. And we pray today, Almighty God, that that information, that story, that knowledge would permeate every part of our being, that we would live like that, that we would live not in arrogancy, but in humility and, in, and just enveloped in this great love, that you loved us so much. Father, we pray for the ability to love others like that, to forgive our enemies, to not retaliate, to show the world a very different narrative and a very different side. Lord, us allow us not to hold grudges, to seek revenge, to make monuments to our pain. Enable us to see past and through and above and to worship you. Lord, today we pray for Texas, we pray for the tiny little church that's worshiping, not in its building, but in a local area, a week after the shooting. Father, we, we pray for those who gather today in the community there. We pray for those who have lost many family members in that church. We pray, Father, not for sense to be made out of the senseless, but for your peace to be felt. We pray for that little church to find ways to praise you through the pain and the suffering and the fear. And God, as we hear stories like that in, in our churches and in our bodies, allow us not to react in anger or in fear, but, but to, to just cling to you, Lord. Pray for the areas of the world that are just ravaged with violence, pain, with with illnesses, with destruction. Pray for areas where people live in fear and in terror. Pray for the pockets of the world that don't know you. We pray for our own country, Lord, and the leadership. We pray for ways for us to find unity, to reflect your peace and your mercy and your grace, as well as to stand up, to be a voice to the voiceless. And Lord, we pray for our own little pockets of the world, our own communities. We pray for Middlebury and the surrounding areas. We pray for those who are suffering through addiction. Pray for those who are homeless right now. Pray for those who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We pray for those who are dealing with relational issues. Pray for those who are dealing with depression and physical pain. And Lord, we ask you to not only walk beside them, but to open our eyes to the people who need to, to have others walk beside them as well. Lord, we continue to pray for Beth and Roy and for Marguerite, for baby Jace, for his continuing healing. And Lord, we pray for ways in our own little body in Memorial Baptist that we can be open to you, that you could speak to us, that we would be on fire to study your word, to be moved past our own stories to your story in this world, Lord. Give us the courage and the strength and the humility and the grace to tell your story. Be with us now as we enter into a time of hearing your story. We ask all these things in your name as we pray the prayer you've taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, they will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Chapter 9, verses 8 through 23, and verses 26 through 28. The Jews in Susa gathered together on the 13th and 14th. Then on the 15th they rested. They made it a day to celebrate with great joy, and they enjoyed good food. That's why Jews who live on, out in the village celebrate on the 4th of Adam. They celebrate that day with joy and enjoy good food. They also gave presents to each other on that day. Mordecai wrote down these events. He sent letters to all the Jews all through the territories of King Xerxes. It didn't matter whether the Jews lived nearby or far away. Mordecai told them to celebrate the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. He wanted them to do it every year. Mordecai told the Jews to celebrate the time when they got the rest from their enemies. That was the month when they sat when the sadness turned into joy. It was when the whipping it turned into a day of for celebrating. He wrote the letters to celebrate those days as times of joy. He wanted to celebrate to enjoy good food. He told them to give presents to a food to one another. He also wanted them to give gifts to people who were poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebrating they had started. They kept doing what Mordecai had written to them. The day the Jews were celebrating were called Purim. Purim comes from the word Pur. Pur means lot. M now the Jews celebrate these two days every year. They do it because of everything that was written in Mordecai's letter. They, so they also do it because of what they had seen and what had happened to them. So they established it as a regular practice. They decided they would always observe these two days of the year. They would celebrate in the required way, and they would celebrate at the appointed time. They and their children after them would always observe these days, and so would all who joined them. These days should be remembered and celebrated. They should be remembered by every family for all time to, to come. They should be celebrated in every territory and every city. The Jews should never stop celebrating the days of Purim. After cho their children after them should always remember these days. This is the, is the word of the Lord. So we're closing out our sermon series on Esther today. Today is the last day. And uh, next week, we're going to have our Thanksgiving celebration. And it's going to be a little bit different than we've, we've had our Thanksgiving services in the past. At the beginning of this sermon series, a little over two months ago, I asked you to think about those things in our lives, in our world, that um, we consider problems or pain or issues. Now, sometimes those are things that are affecting our immediate circle, our own lives. And then sometimes those things are, are bigger issues. They're the things that we worry about that keep us up at night that's going on in our world. Famine, war, addiction, the list goes on. And so the idea was to be able to um, start to formulate and hopefully to release those issues to God. So that's what we're going to do next week. You have an insert in your bulletin that says, I'm giving these joys slash sorrows to the Lord. What you're going to do is to fill this out this week, and you're going to bring it back next week. And the idea is that we're going to give these pain, these issues, these problems, these joys to the Lord at some point during that service. Um, don't worry if you forget these sheets. We'll have new ones next week. And it says joys on here because you may not be in a place of pain and fear. You may be in a place of joy in your life. Or 
you may be able to recognize I've got some worries and some fears and some concerns, but I also have great joy that I want to celebrate. And so there's a place for both there. And again, the idea is for you to be able to spend some time next week bringing that to the Lord. We're going to have um, a very long communion time in the middle of the service. We're going to have deacons for one-on-one -on -one prayer. And we're going to spend time giving that over to God and to um, allowing that pain and that praise simultaneously to be part of the work of God. So put that to the side. You can fill it out if it comes to you during the sermon. Back to Esther. Last week we heard great news that Esther and Mordecai were saved. And not only Esther and Mordecai, but all of the Jews were saved. There's this series of great reversals that happen. Um, Mordecai gets all of Haman's property and his title and his status with the king. And not only were the Jews saved, but on the very day that they were set to die, they were given weapons and um, artillery to be able to defend themselves, and they do. And so there's this, this great reversal that sweeps. The ones that were persecuted are no longer. The ones that were subjugated are now in power. And there's this just wonderful time of peace and, and prosperity in Susa. It won't last, but it's there for now. But the book doesn't end in chapter 8. Chapter 9 and chapter 10 detail ways to remember and to celebrate what took place. Not only to remember the fact that God provided a way out, but to remember the fact that they almost died. And this holiday which you just heard Cohen and Marin read, is something called Purim. Purim is a celebration that takes place to this day in Jewish communities. Purim is from the word, as you heard read, uh, pur, P-U-R, means lot. Purim means lots, plural. The I-M, kirik mem, on the end of the word is the S or E-S, Hebrew equivalent to the English plural. So Purim means lots, plural. Not as in land lots, but as in casting lots, gambling. Remember what the soldiers do with Jesus' clothing at the cross? They cast lots to see who's going to get it. Well, you remember the story, Hammond cast lots to see what day the Jews are going to die. So they name the holiday Poro. Think about that. <laughs> this isn't Esther is a saint day. Or Mordecai is a great, brave, powerful man holiday. It's not even how good is our God day. It's someone gambled with our life day. Forever, for every Jew, for every generation, they are to remember the story of savagery and of God's providence with the very name standing for someone gambled with my life. Someone gambled for when I would die. Why would you do that? Why would you call a holiday something like that? Wouldn't you pick a pithier name? I mean, at least Exodus is the end. They get out. But why not call this something about God's goodness? Um, God provided for me day. And we'll celebrate once a year for two days how God took care of us. But to call it Purim? Why? Because Esther and Mordecai know that pain and praise are woven into the very fibers of our being. That a day is very seldom all bad or all good that the ability to praise God, not in spite of pain, but through it and around it and over it, is part of our story. What they do, in essence, is they make a monument to pain and to praise. And they instruct, in contractual language, every Jew to remember it. Now, I know, monuments <laughs> are very touchy subjects in our culture right now. And I am not going to uh, give you an expose as to where you should land on keeping monuments or getting rid of monuments. 
and I'm not going to tell you what to see in a monument, but don't you find this to be a really interesting discussion in our culture? That we have difficulty with complicated people. We have a difficulty with making a statue to a complicated aspect of our past. Again, I know they're touchy, and I know for some people they're exonerating and uplifting people that are complicated or people that we deem bad, but think about what's really behind some of those issues. I think what the discussion of monuments does in our culture is it exposes to us our need to be able to deem something all good in order to keep it or all bad in order to eradicate it. And yet, the very idea of Purim is this celebration and this mixture of both. I know, it's a lot easier just to completely erase anything that's bad. It's a lot easier to compartmentalize life in categories of all good and just remember the good. But when we do that, we miss being able to tell the stories of our past. Celebrating even what we deem as painful is a way for us to tell the story. It's a way for us to tell what has taken place. And this idea that, that things have to be binary, all good or are all bad in our culture, I would argue is not biblical. Now, do not hear me say that taking down a statue is not biblical. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that what God instructs us throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament is to remember both the bad and the good, the, the harrowing and the joyful, the painful and the praiseworthy. And that is in every single day of our life as well. Nowhere in the ancient world was anyone like the Israelites. The Israelites had this unique calling by God to do just this, to make monuments and to record the stories of their losses as well as their wins. Every once in a while you'll hear this scholarly article that comes out saying there's no topical or historical archaeological evidence to support the exodus in Egypt. There's no documentation on walls or in strata or in any kind of artifact. You know why? It's not because they didn't, it didn't happen, which is usually the summation of the article. It's because you would never record your loss. On no planet are Egyptians going to take an entire wall and record how 150 to 200,000 people escaped their care. They're not going to do it, because in the ancient world, you never, ever, ever recorded your losses. What you did is you wrote about your wins, and you wrote about them in big stone tablets, and you erected those as your monument. One of the most famous is this stone called the Mesha Stone. It's called the Mesha Stone because King Mesha, a Moabite, has it written. And it's written to record this war between the Israelites and the Moabites. And... Moabites, of course, are Lot's people, Israelites, Abraham's. And the, the battle ensues, as the Moabite stone says, between um, the Israelites and the Moabites, and the Moabite god, Chemosh, gives the Israelites, the Moabites, over to the Israelites for a little bit, and then just pummels the Israelites in this brutal, awful battle where there's really no Israelites left. It's a really uplifting tale of victory. When I was in grad school, I was taking this class called Northwest Semitic Inscription, uh, where I translated the, the Mesha stone. Moabite and Paleo-Hebrew are sister languages, so it's written in Moabite, and I translated it. And you're translating it, and it is nauseating. It's nauseating because it is just one glowing praise after another for these big, mighty Moabites, and this wonderful god, Chemosh, who just completely takes out the puny Israelites. That's what you did in the ancient world. You bragged, you smack-talked, and you made a monument to it. And anyone who came in Mesha's palace from then on out would see this giant Mesha stone, and they would read it, and they would know the Moabites were all that in a bag of chips. You would never, ever write down how you lost. You definitely would not record how your God died on a cross, and somehow that was a win. You would never, ever look at the cross and see victory over death. And yet that's our story. So as Christians, embedded in our testimony is the understanding that pain and praise exist, can exist in the same sphere. 
that the ability to praise God means that pain never has to eclipse the goodness of God. It doesn't have to make sense, but it doesn't have to eclipse the goodness of God. The difficulty with this, of telling these stories of pain and praise, is that too often in our world, our stories become either all pain or the avoidance of pain altogether. In uh, this book, Holy, uh, Crazy Holy Grace, uh, Frederick Beekner says that this ability to, to straddle and to put into perspective pain and praise is what it means to be a steward of our pain. A steward of our pain. That means that we're able to tell the stories of what takes place in our life in the context of the big story of what God's doing in the world. And those stories don't ever have to eclipse the pain nor do they eclipse the goodness of God. There's a perspective that is being able to reach. I have some questions for us to consider as we do this. As we, this is the next slide on the computer. One more. <laughs> After, there we go. Some questions to consider as we talk about what it means to have pain and praise in our lives simultaneously. How do we tell these stories and not have one surface at the expense of the other? How do we not make something all good or all bad in our life? Some of these questions, do we make monuments to our pain? Do we make monuments to God's goodness in our life? Do we bury our pain? Are we stewards of our pain, or does our pain steward us? If you wear pain like a big heavy sweater on a 100 degree day, pain is stewarding you. It's awkward, it's itchy, it's uncomfortable, and it's hot. Do we need it to be all good before we can praise God? And do we tell our collective stories with rejoicing and lamentation? Some questions, hopefully, that will influence us for the rest of the sermon. As I've said throughout the duration of the sermon series, I think many of these answers come in our passage today. So let's turn back for the last time to Esther chapter 9. One of the reminders of where what has happened. Esther has been in uh, Susa, in Persia, in a, in a duality, in a role um, where she's kind of straddling two spheres. She's both a um, subject of the court and of the surrounding area. She is not in the leading power group. She is uh, part of that diaspora, which is just a fancy word for saying you got pulled out of your homeland. So she's part of this group that stayed but at the same time, she's not one who's powerless because she's the queen. And so then we, we see her, with the power of God, be able to have this extraordinary strength and bravery and go before the king and, and help deliver her people. Of course, we know she does not deliver her people. God delivers the people. And then there's all these other reversals that begin to happen at the end of chapter 8. We talked about them last week. Um, Hammond's fortune goes to Mordecai. The people who are subjugated and going to be killed are now safe for a time being. And then there's more reversals. The reversals of this tiny little group of individuals that have been seemingly left behind are no longer forgotten. And it answers the question, all these little reversals that happen answer two questions. First it answers the question, does God care about those people left behind? And the answer of course is yes. He's moving and he's working in this big story. But this, uh, the other reversal is that it, it points to the big question of what God's doing throughout humanity and throughout the world. And of course, all of those reversals point to the great reversal in Jesus Christ. When they're done, Mordecai and Esther decide to celebrate. The Jews are free for a little bit. There's a time of peace for a little bit. And so they decide to have this celebration known as Purim, from generation to generation, in Hebrew it says, Vador la Vador, from generation to generation. This is not going to be just in Susa. It's going to span out into the rings of the surrounding areas and then the bigger rings into Jews. And Jews today, of course, still celebrate Purim. There are some uh, specifications of Purim that I think are incredibly important to see how you straddle, how we keep in perspective this ability to have both pain and praise. Okay, the first is that this is for all Jews. Well, that makes sense, right? Haman wanted to kill all Jews. Mm, yeah, no, he didn't. No, right? He didn't want to kill all the Jews. He didn't want to kill the Jews that are in Jerusalem. That's where Nehemiah is at this point. He's in Jerusalem. 
He wanted to kill only the Jews in need and Persia and take their property. So why would you expand this out to all Jews? Isn't this just a story about Esther and Mordecai and the very particular Jews? No. This is a, this is a story for all of the Jews all over time. Esther and Mordecai recognize that the pain that they go through is not just about them, it's about all the Jews in Susa, and it's not just a story about them, it's a story about all the Jews in the world, and it's not just a story about them, it ends up in our Bible, which means we know that the story has lasted and has been celebrated. Esther and Mordecai recognize that their story has a communal effect, that they are living this not just for themselves, but for a bigger picture. Look at one of those. When asking some of these questions, do we see our stories as bigger than just our own individual pain, problems, issues, or needs? Do we see that our stories have bigger connective tissue to the world around us? Are we able to, to put ourselves and our stories out there? This is, this is incredibly important, but it's incredibly difficult to do if we're living in pain. If every single one of our stories is about pain, then it's really, really, really difficult to see past the individual and to allow it to have a bigger scope. So do we tell our stories, do we understand our stories in the context of the world? And do we see our stories as being able to transcend the individual? Esther and Mordecai obviously go from first person plural to being able to see this as a story for all Jews. You can't do that unless you understand that your pain and praise is part of a bigger story. If we live in life with our pain and our issues and our problems ruling us and stewarding us, then it is really incredibly difficult for those stories to transcend the individual and to affect the community. Now, when we're trying to put our stories in perspective of God's movement in the world, we've got to be really careful. Not only we don't want to be saturated in pain, but we have to be really careful, very prayerful about where we're putting God in our stories. It is very easy to make sin about God, our sin, and not about our sin. So we need to very prayerfully do this. But when we see that our stories have a communal effect, that it affects the world around us, then we're able to put our stories into that perspective. And I think a person for me that's really done this is someone like Joni Erickson Tata. We all know who she is, right? Joni Erickson Tata, for those who don't know, um, was uh, paralyzed from the neck down in a freak accident when she was 17 years old. She dove into a body of water off a boat, and it was too shallow. She didn't know it was shallow. She broke her neck, and she's been paralyzed since she was 17. She's in her 60s now. And you look at Joni Erickson Tata, and she, she looks like she's in pain. I mean, even though she's paralyzed, her fingers, uh, which she's now been able to gain just a little bit of movement, they're, they're crippled, they're deformed. She's a beautiful lady, but you can't escape the pain of her story when you look at her. And yet, that's not her story. Her story has surpassed the pain. It has transcended the individual, and she's able to speak into community. She has told her story for 40 years. And not only does she tell her story about praise to God, she's not bitter at God for this, she somehow sees this whole um, trajectory of being paralyzed as part of the plan of God, and she's been able to speak into the community. She is one of the leading advocates for the disabled. It's because of people like Joni Erickson Tata that we have a lot of the services we have today for the disabled. And not only does she speak to the disabled in the world, she speaks in the local church, too. She's been an advocate for how to minister to the disabled. She sat on advisory boards for the disabled in the State Department as well. She is a person who has re recognized how her own individual story can transcend personal pronouns and affect the community. That's what Esther and Mordecai are asking to do. Okay, next up, look at verse 22. Actually, verse 22 is part of an incredibly long run-on sentence. Verse 20 through 23 is one sentence. It's one of those little fun things about translating Hebrew that you go, oh my goodness, we would never get away with this in English. This is ridiculous. It's a long sentence, and in the sentence it tells us that Mordecai sends edicts, they love their edicts in the book of Esther, sends edicts throughout the land in all the areas that Xerxes controls, and part of the way that they are to celebrate and remember Purim is two days a year, 
set aside for feasting and for celebration. Your sorrow's been turned to joy, your mourning's been turned to a holiday, but not only that, part of the celebration is that you give presents to the poor. That's verse 22. What? What do presents to the poor have anything to do with Hammond and almost being killed and being rescued from God? What is that? It's Esther and Mordecai recognizing that even though there is celebration, there is still need in the world. That when you recognize that there is poor in our world, you don't have to have things all good to celebrate God. You have to be able to figure out, how can I praise God in the midst of my pain? How can I see God as all good in the midst of the problems of this world? The simple act of giving presents to the poor was a reminder that Esther was a voice to the voiceless, that she served justice to those who were served injustice. She didn't get to a place where she said, I'm safe, I'm good, you deal with yourself. She recognized the needs of other people. That is the tension we hold as Christians to be able to hold joy while there is still pain around us, to minister to the pain around us without it eclipsing our joy. I left here last Sunday, as did all of you, and one of the very first things I did was I went home and, and I turned on Roku, watched CBS online, and um, I saw the shooting. We had just left worship. And you get home, and, and, and it was funneling in, the shooting, 26 people dead. And, and I, the first thing you think of is, my goodness, we were in here worshiping, and there was death. How do you, how do you reconcile that, right? How, how do you even put that into perspective? And I, I think the thing is, you don't. You don't. Death doesn't diminish the praise, and the praise does not erase the death. And somehow, as Christians, we have to be able to hold those two intentions. Because if we tell people things have to be all good, this is one of the questions, do you need it to be all good to praise God? You're going to miss a whole lot. If our point in life is just to get through the bad, to get through it, we're going to miss a lot. We have to be able to figure out how to praise God through it. So look at verse 27. Um, the next thing that Mordecai and Esther tell them is that this is for the foreigners among them. So this is not just for the Jews in Susa to be remembered for all time. It's not just for the Jews of the whole world to be remembered for all time. There's this unique thing that the Israelites have that's commanded by God, and that is the understanding that if anyone is with us as an alien that's not from outer space, but somebody who's not like us, a foreigner, then we share with them our holidays and our celebrations. So Passover is one of the most famous, where... God decrees this time that you're supposed to tell the story of the Exodus. And he says in Leviticus and in Exodus, it doesn't matter whoever's in your household, whether they're Jew or not, they take part in the Seder. They take part in the story. So Mordecai and Esther are extending that to the areas around, which means that all the people, whether they are Jewish by descent, I mean, the book of Esther affects us. It speaks to us, and we're not Jewish. All of us are supposed to be told in the story. So Purim is not just to be celebrated by Jews. It's supposed to be celebrated by anybody in your community, in your family, in your household, in your work that is not Jewish as well. Why? <laughs> because our stories are evangelism. Because when we tell our stories, not of our own survival, but of how God has worked in our lives, it evangelizes people. The story of Purim tells about God's sovereignty, it tells about God's protection, it tells about God's grace, and it tells it not just to the ones who should know the story, but to the world that needs to hear that story. That's what we are supposed to be doing. If we feel like we have to redact our stories, we have to edit our stories so that we tell our story in Christian terms to our Christian friends, but then we say, eh, I don't really want to tell it to my coworkers because they, they would seem stupid or they wouldn't understand what I'm talking about. When we do that, we don't understand the importance of our stories as evangelism. We don't understand the importance of how our stories are telling the big story, the big meta narrative of God moving in this world. I want to read to you from this, this book, Holy Grace. And, and Beekner talks about this. 
Beekner says that um, all of our lives should be remembered. We remember all of our lives anyway, unless we've blocked it out because of trauma, but we remember the good things and the bad things. We celebrate the joyful things, maybe even when we mark the, the, the anniversaries of the really bad in our life, but he says, cautions us not to do that in isolation. Not to do that just by ourselves, but to understand that we should be doing that in community. And he says this. Um, he has a dream one night where he uh, is in a hotel room and he goes to his room, but it's not the room he wants. He had wanted another room. and that, So he goes to the hotel clerk in his dream and he says, this isn't the room I wanted. I wanted the other room. And the hotel clerk says, no, that room's not available. That room's called Remember. And so he has this whole chapter he devotes to a room called Remember. And the point of the chapter for him is that he, he drew such comfort from the memory, even if they were bad ones. So he says this. He says, to remember my life is to remember countless times when I might have given up, gone under. When humanly speaking, I might have gotten lost beyond the power of any to find me. But I didn't. I've not given up. And each of you, with all the memories you have and the tales you could tell, also have not given up. You also are survivors and are here. And what does that tell us, our surviving? It tells us that as weak as we are, a strength beyond our strength has pulled us through at least this far, to at least this day. Foolish as we are, a wisdom beyond our wisdom has flickered up just often enough to light us, if not the right path through the forest, at least to the path that leads forward. Faint of heart as we are, a love beyond our power to love has kept our hearts alive. What's Beekner saying? The goal is not to survive. <laughs> the goal is that through all of that, we tell those stories, and what we're really telling is the story of the one who's stronger than us, whose strength we rely on, whose wisdom we rely on, whose power we rely on, and whose love carried us through. That is evangelism. Esther and Mordecai get that, and they understand that when we tell this to the ones around us that are not Jewish, it evangelizes them. Okay, then the last one is verse 28. So this is not just for the Jews in Susa, it's not just for the Jews in the world, it's not just for the foreigners that are with us. This is forever. This is forever. When you translate chapter verse 28 in, uh, from Hebrew to English, it is legalistic language. It is the language of covenant, meaning Mordecai and Esther are making the Jews of Susa promise to teach this to their children from generation to to generation forever and ever and ever think about that this is genealogy this is history this is theology and this is community Esther and Mordecai aren't telling just the good part they're telling the whole thing the savagery of a barbarian that held their hand, life in his hands and gambled for when they would die, as well as how God provided for them. And there is no point in telling this story that Esther and Mordecai think that this will diminish the character of God. They don't feel like they got to hide the part about Haman to prove that God is good. At least one person had to be asking over the years, why would God even allow that to begin with? It's great he saved you. But why would he even make you go through that? But they tell the story, knowing those questions will be asked, and knowing that it doesn't eclipse the love of God. Uh, a long time ago, right after the Holocaust Museum in D.C. opened, I went to see the Holocaust Museum. Um, when I was a junior in high school, I, I obsessed is the wrong word, but in AP history, I, I, I studied Holocaust, and I read every narrative I could get um, of, the, of the survivors, stories that were just harrowing. And in um, all the details of the Holocaust, what they would say is that the museums, the concentration camps that had been left standing and had turned into museums would often place in them rooms filled with the possessions of the people. And I would see these pictures of rooms that were filled maybe with suitcases and, or rooms that were filled with teeth or rooms that were filled with um, jewelry. And so when I went to the DC one, and I've got a picture of it, um, 
one of the first places, is the next slide, one of the first places that you walk into, um, oh, it's not there, it's okay. It's okay. It's a room of shoes. Google it when you go home. Google DC um, Memorial Holocaust Museum and, and look at the room of shoes. You walk in, and one of the first things you see is it's kind of a dark room, and there's a light right on the shoes. And it's a wall of shoes. And it's not all the shoes of who died in the concentration camp, but there are thousands and thousands of shoes. And you stand there, and the light are on these shoes, and they're dusty, and they're dressed, there's really nice, expensive shoes, like rich people, and there's broken down, tattered shoes, where you knew it was somebody who was much poorer. There are baby shoes. And as much as I had read, as much as I had studied, that image took my breath away. I mean, one of the narratives I read was of a, of a girl who survived the concentration camp, but she watched each one of her parents go off to the gas chambers. And somehow, those words were not as impacting to me as those shoes. And you're standing there, and you're looking at this, and you know the story. I mean, we all know the story. But the sight of those shoes made me want to run. It literally made me want to get out of that place. It was so horrific. It was so powerful. And it was such a reminder to me of seeing those shoes, what happens when evil goes unchecked. All the words didn't move me the way those shoes did. But there's a temptation when you're talking about things that big, that painful, to say, just get over it. Just forget it. But you know you can't forget it. I mean, clearly Jews have gotten over it, because if Jews hadn't gotten over it, there wouldn't be a single Jew who worshiped God today. The point is not to, to necessarily get over it, but to praise God through it. To understand looking at those shoes, that there had to be at least one person during that time asking, why is God allowing this to happen? And, and standing there in both the pain and knowing the end, that God was still there. It's a very powerful reminder of our testimonies. The Jews do not get raised up because of this situation at the end of Esther. You've read the Bible, spoiler alert, they will find themselves in trouble again. They will be persecuted. They will go back into exile again. They are a minority. They are a small band of believers who are constantly being overrun, outdone, and outmaneuvered. So they don't get on top ever. But the story of Esther is a story of how God moved through Esther's actions, Mordecai's steadfastness, Xerxes' decrees and edicts, and even Haman's wild nature. It's a story that's a reminder of us of the goodness of God. And we forget those stories when we don't build our own monuments to them as a collective group of individuals, not even so much as individuals, when we don't take into account our own pearls in our lives. God's story in Purim is not just a story of their life being in the hands of Haman. Haman might have gambled for their life, but the truth is the life of the Jews were always in the hands of God. God is in control today just as much as in the day and time of Esther. Let's pray. Grace and mighty God, take us now into a time of silence. Allow us to meditate on your word, we pray. Amen.
for each step that I might take. For each load that I might bear. For each mountain I might face. For each river that might impede. For each place where I might rest. For each sunrise and sunset. Please turn to your hymnal. And we'll be singing hymn 382. to join us downstairs for lunch. Gracious Lord, take us now into your world, into community. Allow us to reflect you to see. Amen. Amen. 